I'm, I'm dealing not here just with with a uh, a water ski kind. I'm dealing with a glider, and on the way home, my head went, <laughs> and, and I could see I could see foot launching. I could see the future of this thing, and that this is. Uh, uh, September the 8th, 1963, and by the 11th of October, in other words, only one month later, I had a patent pending number from the Australian Patents Office. Unfortunately, I didn't go through with it because when I talked to the patents attorney, when he made a special trip to Sydney, they said, okay, well, no problem at all. For about £50,000, $100,000, which would mean 10 houses in Australia, we can give you complete protection so uh, I sort of dropped that one. And uh, we continued to fly the glider and we flew an average of about 10 to 15 minutes twice a week each. This is Rod Fuller and myself. Uh, Rod became, is a, is turned out a natural pilot. I might have been as gifted as him, but nevertheless we, we both were getting better and better at flying. So by the time the jack o Lantern Festival had come along, We'd had the, every weekend we flew on Saturday and Sunday. We both flew probably for 10 minutes on each tow. So we had quite a bit of time with it and uh, the big day arrived and around about 10 in the morning, Rod Fuller um, did his jump start and flew at the Jack Lantern Festival. I was scheduled to fly at around four in the afternoon. A 30 knot nor'east blew up. So that year, to my chagrin, I didn't fly. And I was really upset about it because it's always an easy that the bloody guts to fly, did he? Mm -hmm. The next year, uh, in, after that, I built a, a smaller one. I realised that it wasn't going to be suitable for skiing because it flew too slowly. It needed something that flew uh, at around 25 to 35 mile an hour to match the speed of a ski boat, and so it didn't go off plane. So I scaled them down. There was the Mark II model, which was around 14 foot six, something like that. Then I came down to the Mark III, which again was a wooden structure, a steel A-frame, and again back to the plastic, sticky tape and plastic. And I flew that glider for nearly a year. And there's some strange things about it. Again, a lot of junk. And you see this A-frame over here. I went up with an A-frame like that. Everyone copied it around the world for 10 years. Guess where it came from? Up at the tip, I had the end of a bed. I took the end of the bed off, turned it over, down tube, and bent it in. Copied everywhere all over the bloody world. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> I a couple of lugs on it. Ken's got all the pictures. And, uh, and, and so, in October the 21st, uh, 1963, the Daily Examiner published photographs of the glider on their front page. And uh, uh, it did two things. It established that we'd, we'd developed the glider in, in Australia. It had the A-frame. I had found that I had to, I used a sort of water ski kite arrangement initially with the glider. And there's the, the big, there's a big picture there. And then I found the, the keel would sort of sprung and move left and right in the wing. So it went in like that and that's, how the A-frame was born and stiffened the whole structure up. Yep. That, that's a, so the struts way. actually went from the base tube up to the ends of the crossbar rather than coming into the middle. So the idea that I pinched the A-frame from somewhere else or just added or a gallow wing to load it below me. Uh, it, and that's it, the story that I had always <laughs> heard that there was just, that everything was just right, you know, the wing was already there and you just kind of hung a triangle on it yeah. and that, I, so completely diminishes the complete development oh, yeah, that you've yeah. described. So uh, then I undertook, um, uh, I guess, from, from well, 1963 right through to when we left Grafton, a period of intense flying. Uh, I, I've been trying to estimate with Ken just how, how much time we had, but by the time 1965 came along, uh, Rod and I would have had at least 30 hours in the air with the wing. 1966, I set an endurance record of something like two hours on the Horseshoe River. 1969, quite a deal later, um, about six hours. Uh, 
Um, we started free gliding in 1964. And the free gliding, uh, you mean releasing? Releasing off the rope and, and free gliding then. But prior to that, you actually had many opportunities to experience the wing without being pulled because you would overfly oh, the yeah. rope. Yes. So you'd yeah. overfly the rope so then you were completely yeah. free. Uh, in around January 1964, before we broke the glider up and turned it into a barbecue, uh, <laughs> I, I was flying on a 210 foot of rope and I kind of even imagine why I was doing that. We more or less settled on 140 feet, and I was pretty well up over the boat and ran into a thermal along the edge of Susan Island and found myself over the tops of the trees. And the wind's blowing this way, and, and it's going, <laughs> and I'm looking out, and we've been flying. I don't think we're going to fly two or three times. And here is from September to January, and I'm looking out, and we're doing this up, and I can see the sticky tape. Uh, you know, I thought. So uh, the boat driver literally stopped the boat and, and I started to glide down the, sleep, the, the slack rope because we had no releases on the glider at that stage and he pick, picked it up and caught me at about 50 feet. So this, these are the sorts of things that, that went on and I, I find it amazing that uh, you know people of, in 1971 are talking about hand gliding in America here and you're getting flights of seconds when we got ours in the air. And, th and that was the story for many years that, that was the accepted story that somehow this event, and then I, I echoed this event, this, this story myself, that this event precipitated the modern sport. There was a little bit of flying and then this happened and the National Geographic got everybody involved in it and then suddenly it just flowed from there. But that wasn't the beginning, not even close, and it certainly had it been the beginning, it, it was not replicated. There was very little that this caused people to do except imagine and think about flying. It was not the kind of flying that John was doing, you know, eight years before. This photograph was published uh, along with one other on the uh, uh, Daily Examiner on October 21st, 1963. And that photograph found its way through a guy called Robin Bishop in Brisbane to Francis Regello. I was contacted by Francis Regello in around September, October 1964, asking me for details on my wing. A year after you got, you we've actually been flying first three flew. Years. And uh, we've, we've been flying three, three gliding for more than six months on the wing. And uh, it, he sent a very nice letter um, and with some technical data, which you know involves these things over here. The Parasev, uh, and I want to make this clear, Parasev was not just the, uh, it was the whole paraglider experimental thing right across the board. And he sent... Uh, this is the Parasev. Yeah, that one. That, that, that was, that's been sort of been called Parasev. People regard that to be the Parasev. Parasev was everything. It was the one of the pterodactyl thing up in the corner. It was the gliding parachute, which I showed you earlier, from which I got my inspiration. And it, uh, and it was split up into Ryan Aircraft and North American, I think also Delta. Ryan had the Parasev uh, <coughs> 3, the, the one with the, this one here. Uh, yeah, Ryan did this, that. This was the Ryan did the, the frame there thing, and North American were doing the flexible wings, the, the parachutes themselves. This one they refer to as the fleet, yeah. and they also had another one called the. Uh, excuse me, this is the flex wing. There was another one called the, the fleet. Yeah, the whole the whole process was uh, parachute. Everything was all parachute. I didn't know that till all of this data. I wish I'd had it before I started building the model. And strangely, I wound up with an 80 degree nose angle and also a 90 degree pattern cut and it seemed to me that they're all about the same. It's also important to note that a guy called Mike Burns, who was an, aura, an Australian aura, aeronautical engineer, graduated from Sydney University, uh, started experimenting in 1962 and I didn't know anything about this and he produced a little uh, uh, glider mounted on two floats with uh, a delta wing pretty much the same as mine. Uh, his, he flew before I did, and I knew nothing about him, and a picture of, uh, uh, appeared in a magazine. 
So I sent uh, to the solicitor a letter to him saying, you can't do this, you've got my bloody aeroplane design there and we're going to have to do something about it. Uh, he came back to me and eventually we talked on the phone and became firm friends when I realised that he had de developed his wing completely independently from mine. Uh, I finished flying in 1965 in, in Grafton and moved back to Sydney. The guy I was working for passed away. And when I got back to Sydney, Mike and I got together and he, uh, we came to an arrangement. He was going to build my gliders alongside his because he already had the facilities to do it. And he's also doing repair work for uh, people with chipmunk aircraft and he had a number of people working for him. Before I, Burns actually made any of your wings, you had made and sold maybe three. I sold three or four of them, yeah, including a guy called Ray Layton, the picture which of his wings in there. So you actually were the first hang glider manufacturer. Yes. <laughs> Even before Mike Burns. Yes. Yes. Well, was, was a well, long run of well, manufacturing. Mike was <laughs> setting up for, for mass production in a small way, one week, three a week. He, um, very interesting, two mines. Mine not classically trained, and his classically trained by uh, Sydney University and with all the technical information available from NASA at that time. Uh, and when we came down to the wing on his glider and the wing on mine, my bolt holes went through his bolt hole. Whoa. And he built his gliders uh, with models the same as I did, and he said he chucked them off a pipe out of Botany Bay, the big red pipe. Um, so uh, it, the one thing he didn't have in his uh, wings was batten. So I'd gone the whole way and had battens on my wings, which you can see in the, well, that's 1967, but 1965, I had battens in <coughs> 64, 65. This I is 65, right? Wing. Yeah. So my wing was fully developed. It's been flown in every way you could <coughs> possibly conceive. Uh, it, it, it was a fully developed aeroplane. And, and I felt that I graduated from university when Mike Burns, as I said, a fully qualified aero engineer, made no modifications to my wing whatsoever in terms of its general structure and design. He didn't go along with the battens and uh, just used his wing because it was cheaper. And he decreased the thickness of the flying wire. That's the only thing he did. And he also put a, a little steel sleeve just along there instead of the wood plate that I used instead of a king post. And, uh, Otherwise, it was the same wing. So that's that's where we were in 1966. I set an endurance record with a wing that he'd built in his factory to, for advertisement. Uh, this attracted two particular people who became figures around the world. And both of them wanted to fly one of my wings. And Bill Moyes and Bill Bennett um, uh, contacted Mike Burns, who contacted me. An arrangement was made to do a trial flight uh, with both of these guys. So they turned up in the March 1967, so four, nearly four years after <coughs> I'd been flying this wing. And, and at, at that point, March of 67, you had about 30 